and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, on this day of great rejoicing, we welcome you as our King and our Savior. Yet we also walk in the shadow of your cross. We cry, Hosanna, in your name. And we ask that you strengthen our faith on this Palm Sunday, so that when the time comes to carry the cross, you will give us the grace and courage to follow you out from darkness and into the fullness of light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
the name of the Lord. Blessed is the son of David. You see, it's that cry that welcomes Jesus into Jerusalem. That cry that echoes throughout the ages. Listen to the word of the Lord from Matthew 21, 1 through 11 this morning. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus sent two of them out ahead, and he said, Go into the village over there, and as soon as you enter, you'll see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. Now if anyone asks what you're doing, just say, The Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, Look, your king is coming to you. He's humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So the two disciples did as Jesus commanded, and they brought the donkey and the colt to him. And they threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. And most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him. And others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And Jesus was in the center of the procession. And all the people around him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And the entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? The people asked. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. I want to focus just for a second on that last line. The entire crowd of Jerusalem, the entire city, is in an uproar as Jesus makes his entry. And yet when they're asked, when the people who are processing with Jesus are asked, who is this? Why, why the commotion? Why the uproar? Why the special attention? Who is this man? Notice what the people say. They don't say this is the Messiah. They don't say, here comes our king. They say, this is the prophet Jesus, the man from Nazareth. And friends, I want to ask you a question this morning. I want to ask you, how do you see Jesus this morning? Is Jesus just a great teacher, prophet, a man? Or is Jesus the king of kings? Is Jesus the one? who fulfills all scripture. Is Jesus the one who dies in our place to grant us redemption? Who is this? The crowd asks. And the crowd, the crowd that followed Jesus, they reply, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. And I ask you this morning, friends, as we come to prayer, to focus on that. Who is Jesus to you? So we go to prayer this morning, a couple announcements. The first is this. Please keep uh, the Meisner family and the um, Williams family in your prayers. We got a phone call last night, late. Eunice is in hospice, or will be in hospice care on Monday. Um, she is fading rapidly. Um, and so just prayers around that for Dave and Karen, for Sarah and Roz. And the family as they walk this road, um, that God would just be extra gracious to them during this time. Um, I can tell you from visits past, Eunice has been waiting for this day for quite some time. And so it's a matter of walking with the family well and um, yeah, just continued prayers for them. Um, Marty is here, she's doing well. Um, thank you for upholding us in your thoughts and prayers throughout the last couple weeks. Um, she is able to eat um, somewhat. I'm still on a very limited diet, but she's doing well. And, um, and then Steve DeMann also is continuing to make steady progress in his um, recovery from his hernia surgery. So just keep Steve in your thoughts and prayers. The rest are listed there. I wonder if, as we go to God in prayer this morning, if there's other prayers in the midst of God's people this morning. Let's pray together. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Lord, that's what gathers us this morning. That's the song that we cry to you. Because we know, Lord, that without Palm Sunday, there would be no Easter tomb resurrection. 
and no joy, Lord, for the Christian life, because without the resurrection, Paul, the apostle, is right. That our hope is in vain. Our hope is useless without the resurrection. So, Father, on this Palm Sunday, help us celebrate your entry into Jerusalem on this last week, this holy week. Lord, there's much that will be done. There's, there's many places we'll go in this week and many things that will buy for our attention. But as your people, Lord, we pray that over our week ahead, we would fully prepare ourselves to gather at the mystery of the resurrection too next Sunday. That we would have hearts that stop with awe and wonder at what you've done. Father God, that you've orchestrated this from the very beginning of the created order. That you put in a substitution for the atonement that needed to take place. A perfect lamb that ended all sacrificial systems. A perfect lamb that bled for all who believe. And that blood, Lord, is powerful enough to save a wretch like me. And so thank you for Jesus' blood. Thank you for the symbol of humility that we see in the story of the entrance to Jerusalem on this last week, the unbroken colt and the donkey that Jesus rode upon. Not a war horse stallion, not a chariot inlaid with gold. The King of Kings rode into Jerusalem on a humble beast of burden. Knowing, knowing he would carry all the load of our sins. That he would go to the cross, that he would be mocked and ridiculed, that he would be tortured and tormented. That the devil and all the minions of Satan would do their very best to get him to walk away from the cross and just say, forget it, it's not worth it. And yet, willingly he went, willingly he died, willingly he suffered. And he did it for me. And friends, I pray that you would make that personal on this week. So Father, thank you for the blood of the cross. Even as we celebrate Palm Sunday, thank you for not turning your back on Jerusalem, not walking past Jerusalem, not fully drinking to the very last the cup of suffering. And thank you for the resurrection tomb and thank you for the life that that brings each of us. And Father, I'm, pray, I'm bold enough to pray, Lord, over the needs of our congregation and the resurrection's power. Needs of health and healing, Lord. Needs of a quickening of your spirit to hover near. Needs of comfort for those who are grieving. Needs of peace in the midst of family dynamics and family tensions. Needs of a little bit more faith to take the next step in our life with you. And whatever the need is, Lord, we claim the power of the cross and we claim the power of the resurrection tomb that you will move in ways that are far beyond and far removed from how we would ever think or imagine or even dare ask. Whether it's out loud or whether it's in our hearts. I'm bold enough to pray that, Lord, because the power of the cross is ours for all who believe. And so this morning, Lord, I pray that power would radiate, your power would radiate through us. That in the situations you placed us in, Lord, your power would emanate from the cross to each of us. And that as it arrests us, as it overwhelms us, Lord, that 
We would be your image bearers in the world around us. No matter where you call us to go, Lord, may our response be, Yes, Lord, here am I, send me. And even as Isaiah prayed that, Lord, he knew the reality full well after looking at you, after standing in your presence, he knew that he was a man of unclean lips, that he was flawed, fatally so. And yet, Lord, just as you touched his lips with a burning coal, so you touch us with that same burning coal, and you say, go, spread the message of the gospel. And if you need to use words, what an awesome reality if we remember Jesus' words that in the way they treat me, they'll treat you, and that don't worry about it. When they bring you before people, when they bring you before their kings and their rulers and their elected officials, just represent me and let my Holy Spirit take over. And so, Father, in our situations, in the lives that we live, we're praying for the Holy Spirit's power to come and take over. That we, Lord, can simply be faithful. This is our call. This is our challenge. And now, Lord, as we look at the words of Scripture, Father, as we consider Christ's words from the cross, the very last words which punctuate His earthly ministry, it is finished. Father, we pray that Hosanna's would reign as we understand what this means to each of us. So, Father, bless Your Word as it goes forth. With Isaiah, we pray that it would prosper and it would indeed not return to You void or empty, but it would prosper and it would flourish. And bless me, Father. May I fall behind and watch as you come and invade this space this morning. Speak to us, Lord. Our hearts yearn to hear what you have to tell us. Give us courage for the week ahead. We pray this in the holy precious, powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's in him, His name we pray this. Amen. Just a couple points before I begin this morning. The points are this. On Friday, we will worship together with Martin Reformed Church at Martin Reformed Church. That service will be at 7 o'clock Friday evening, combined area-wide combined service with Martin Reformed Church, 7 o'clock this coming Friday, end of Friday. Point number two is this. On Easter Sunday morning, which is already next week, I don't know how we've got to April, but it's here. And we're blessed because the first weekend of April is Easter weekend. On Easter Sunday morning at 7 o'clock, we will have an Easter Sunday sunrise service here at East Martin. So 7 o'clock at night, Friday night, good Friday. 7 o'clock in the morning, next week Sunday morning for an Easter sunrise sun service. The other thing I want to emphasize is this. As Sarah alluded to this morning, you were given palm fronds when you walked in. And so during my message... I didn't forget. Um, during my message, we have a special uh, saying, and that's the saying of Palm Sunday. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And kids and adults, whenever you hear Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, wave the palm branches. Because we're here to celebrate Palm Sunday. We're here to celebrate that reality that Jesus didn't turn his back away from Jerusalem. Rather, Jesus entered and embraced this last week of Jerusalem, knowing, knowing full well where it would lead him. Knowing that the shouts, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, would end in crucify, crucify him. May his blood be upon us and our children. And so we're here to celebrate this morning the fact that Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins. And the message this morning is it is finished and that message is found from John 19, the verses 28 through 37 in the Pew Bibles. It's found on page 1685. 
Listen to the word of the Lord this morning from John 19, 28 to 37. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Now a jar of wine vinegar was there, and so they soaked a sponge in it. And they put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and they lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation. The next day was to be a special Sabbath, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. So the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus. And then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of water and blood. And the man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. And our text verse this morning is the verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! It is finished. God's redemption plan is complete. It is finished. And rather than being a, a dismal, depressing, barely audible cry of surrender and defeat, this, friends, is the wild, exuberant cry of victory. Jesus Christ had endured to the very end. You see, it's the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians. 521 who reminds us for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. For our sake he made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin who knew no sin. So that in him, in Jesus Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. It is finished. Christ had fully accomplished Almighty God's redemptive plan perfectly. All is complete. All is finally fully finished forever. He had walked the lonely road from heaven to Bethlehem's manger, from Bethlehem's manger to Calvary's cross. Jesus walked the road perfectly. It's hard for us to fathom that, isn't it? knowing that the king in glory from his heavenly spot beside the right hand of Almighty God said, I will do this. From the very foundations of the world, Scripture tells us God had this redemptive plan in mind. That Jesus Christ would come, that he would be born of a virgin in the Immaculate Conception, that he would enter Jerusalem here on this Palm Sunday with loud hosannas, hosannas in the highest, that he would suffer this last week, and that he would give up his life as a ransom for us. That's the way God had in mind all that. And yet before he surrenders himself to death, there's one final exclamation, one final word from the cross. That word, friends, is it is finished. Now you see in English, that's three words. I didn't, I didn't miscount. In Greek, it's one. It is finished. It's interesting to note 
that the bookmarks of Christ's ministry begin and end with loud cries of victory. Do you remember what the very first thing that happened to Jesus Christ as he emerges from obscurity to begin his earthly ministry? Who remembers what Christ went through the very first thing in his earthly ministry? The real question. Let's bury the first thing Christ went through in his earthly ministry. It's okay, we can talk in church. The temptation, right? He's driven into the wilderness. Right? We remember that story. Matthew 4 tells us that story before he does anything. And it's interesting because here's the deal. Matthew 5 is the Beatitudes. Matthew 5 establishes the perfect pattern for us as Christians to emulate. But before Jesus says any words, as he emerges from the shadow of the carpenter's shop to begin ministry, he is driven into the wilderness. He's tempted by Satan. Tempted and tested and pressed against by Satan. If you're the son of God, Tell these stones to become bread and, and, and take a bite out of it. Wait, time out. Satan had done that to Eve, right? Did God really say back in the garden, Ah, here's an apple. Take a bite out of it, Eve. Look how good it looks. And now he said, Jesus, hey, if you're the son of God, if you're really who you say you are, look at those stones and tell them to become bread and take a bite out of it. Jesus says, no way. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the Father's mouth. Strike one. If you're the Son of God, so you continue, throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple. For it is written. All of a sudden, the devil starts playing with Scripture. You know, he's, he's like... If Jesus can come back at me and, and, and can, can recite Scripture to me to, to thwart my efforts, then I'm going to play with Scripture. For it is written, says saying, He will command His angels concerning you, and you will not strike your foot on a stone. So go ahead. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself from the temple. And Jesus looks right at him and He says, You know what, Satan? Yeah, you're right. It is written that, but it's also written, Do not put the Lord your God to a test. So no, I'm not going to do it. Strike two. Strike three is this. If you're the Son of God, look out over everything. Bow down to me and worship me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the land. Can't wrap my head around that one. The eternal King of Heaven being tested to bow down to Satan and to serve Satan for all the kingdoms of the earth when everything belongs to him in the first place? And Jesus says, no, no, strike three. You shall worship the Lord your God alone, and him shall you serve. And then, and then, friends, here's what happens. He looks at Satan and he says, be gone, Satan. And now here, Years later, three years to be exact, hanging on the cross of Good Friday, he says, Satan, it's finished. You've done your best to try to thwart God's plan, but it is finished. And with that, we receive the victory. Amen? Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Because God had this plan all along, and Jesus had done it. Never once does he back away from it. Never once does he, does he try to get out of it. We can argue today that there's this, this, this prayer in Gethsemane's garden that says, Lord, please take this cup from me. But... We're kind of arguing from a position of foolishness if we say that's God trying to, or that's Jesus trying to eke his way out of the responsibility of the cross because what does he finish that prayer with? 
And it's the prayer that you and I must find ourselves saying all the time, is it not? God, please remove this cup from me. But even so, even though this is what I want, even though I feel the immense weight of responsibility, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. So even, even Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane isn't Jesus trying to find his way out from the responsibility of the cross. He had done it without as much as one stumble or stutter stop. Jesus Christ had his eyes forever fixed and focused on Almighty God, his faithful Heavenly Father. Even here on the cross of Good Friday, as he willingly surrenders himself over to death and becomes the sinless sin bearer. So yes, friends, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. It is finished. What does Christ mean by that? It is finished. Christ's suffering is now complete. I love what John Ortberg says. No suffering you go through is suffering Jesus will not endure in order to save you. No suffering you go through is suffering Jesus will not endure in order to save you. Think about that for a second. Look back over your life. Maybe you don't have to look that far. And, and, and see those times where suffering was part of the journey. And then hear John Orberg talk to you. Hear God speak to you from this phrase. There's no suffering you will go through that Jesus Christ has not endured in order to save you. It's Isaiah 53, verse 10. This morning from the message, and tonight Pastor Mark will expound more on it. Isaiah 53, 10 says this, Still it's what God had in mind all along, to crush him with pain, the plan was that he'd give himself as an offering for sin so that he'd see life come from it. Life. Life. And more life. And God's plan will deeply prosper through him. As I've said already, it's the eternal purposes of God for the redemption of the world that was finally fully accomplished through Jesus Christ's cry in his finish. Though Satan had tried to mess it up, though he had meddled with it, though, though the world was stacked against him, though his friends forsook him, though all of the spiritual forces of darkness had conspired to co-opt and corrupt, and they had fought valiantly, because of and through Christ Jesus alone, Almighty God wins. That's the beauty of it, isn't it? Because of Jesus Christ, God wins. How many remember the Christian singer Carmen? Anybody remember Carmen? I challenge you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go home today and YouTube the champion to see this epic spiritual warfare <laughs> play out. Because in the end, God is the champion. Christ Jesus, now crucified, took upon himself all the wrath that was rightfully ours. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. <clears throat> he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Christ Jesus, now crucified, took upon himself all the wrath that was rightfully ours. <clears throat> we could look at that from the New Testament too, couldn't we? It's what Paul says in Romans 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Were it not for Jesus Christ, that's what you and I would deserve. That's what our inheritance would be, is death. But I say again, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest because Jesus Christ came. He 
he died, he walked the path, willingly suffered and surrendered himself to death for you and for me. Praise God, amen? That's what Palm Sunday is all about, is, is that Jesus Christ stands at Jerusalem's gate, and, and, and the people celebrate, they, they start crying out hosannas. And, and as Jesus sees them, what does he do? He, he doesn't back away. <laughs> it's the second time that John tells us Jesus weeps. Because as he sees the people, there's a response elicited deeply within Jesus Christ that says this, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oh, I long to gather you as a mother chick, or as a mother hen gathers her chicks to hide you safely under my wings and protect you. But you would not let me. But notice, notice Jesus doesn't turn his back away from Jerusalem. Jesus rides into Jerusalem. He goes through the events of Holy Week. And here on Good Friday's cross, the last utterance, the last words from Christ Jesus on that cross are, it is finished. And with that, all the suffering, all the pain, all the animosity that he knew throughout this life, that we don't throughout this life, he left there on that cross. It is finished. The second thing is this, it is finished. In all the prophecies of God's coming Messiah, Jesus Christ are finally fully fulfilled. Jesus is the fulfillment of Scripture. Matthew 5, 17 says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them. I've come to fulfill them. The people around Jesus were, were thinking to themselves, like, there's a new king here. And, and because the new king is here, that means that the old way is done away with. That means that all the laws, like, we don't have to follow them anymore. And Jesus says, wait, time out. Time out. Is that, is that really what you think? You think that I've come to set up, establish my own kind of kingdom? I haven't come to establish a kingdom. I've come to fulfill every prophecy and law that was ever written. And I'm fulfilling them in myself. And on the cross, Christ Jesus has indeed fulfilled all the New Testament, all the Old Testament prophecies. I wonder if I were to ask you this morning what the purpose of the Old Testament was and is, if you would be able to respond. You see, there's book after book, there's verse after verse, there's chapter after chapter, and yet it points to one specific thing, and that's God's redemption plan. The entire Old Testament is a vivid panoramic picture of God's redemption plan. There's other things in there to be sure, but its overriding purpose is to lay out, to put flesh on, to give us a picture of God's redemption plan. But here's the thing. The scarlet thread, as it were, that runs throughout all of Scripture this is a messianic strand or strain. It's Yahweh God operating and interacting in the space and time of Israel's half history to prepare the way for the coming Messiah. I don't know who W.A. Criswell is. I know that his initials stand for uh, uh, two doctorate degrees that he's earned, but I love what he says. The scarlet thread of redemption is this. The scarlet thread of redemption is woven throughout Scripture. It traces God's unfolding plan of love to redeem fallen mankind. And so from Genesis to Revelation, this red ribbon represents our need for an innocent blood sacrifice. 
Ultimately, God sent his son to die on the cross as that sacrifice for our sins. John 3, verse 16. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Friends, that scarlet stream is throughout the Old Testament. Doesn't matter where or when or how God shows up to Israel, He's always reminding them of His coming Messiah, of the redemption plan that's been established before the world began. But friends, I want you to take that and to apply that to your to your heart this morning, because the messianic strain is also what keeps each of us as believers and faith followers of Jesus Christ. It keeps us keeping on. You see, because of God's messianic strain was throughout all of the Old Testament. If God's messianic strain doesn't end with revelation, then it encompasses you and I. Which means, watch this now, watch this. No matter how bad things look in the world around us, who's watched the news this week? Legit question, right? We've watched the news this week. I need some acknowledgments that I know you're tracking with me. We've watched the news this week. And there, there's, there's any number of things we could look at and say, man, that is messed up. I don't get it. I don't understand it. It's messed up. Who's been in a spot this week where you just think about it and it's like, man, that's messed up? Again, right? We got stuff in our life. I'm sorry, but if you're here and you're alive and you're breathing, you've got stuff in your life. Don't fool yourself. You have stuff in your life that doesn't make sense. All of it. All of it because of the messianic strain of Jesus Christ. All of it will be set right. How about mistakes or missteps or double backs or start overs? Man, I know about my life. Missteps, double back, start overs, they're apparent every week. How about the continuous problem of sin in our personal lives? Because of Jesus Christ, it's all made right. God's redemptive purpose will never fail, friends. How can we be certain of this? It was as a three year old that I learned this little song, the B I B L E. Anybody remember that song? It says the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Like I said, here's the reality of that. The Bible tells me so. Hebrews. It's Hebrews who says, Jesus Christ, Almighty God in the flesh, is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It means that God doesn't change. That's one of the beauties of our God, is that He's the great unchanging one. Which means that, that acts in the Mount of Transfiguration and Ascension, that's not just for Peter and John and James. That's for you and I today. The angels, as the, as the disciples are standing there, they're, they're being transformed into the apostles, and, and, and they're like, where'd he go? The cloud hides them, right? And Jesus rises to heaven in the cloud. Then what do the angels do? As they stand there, they're like, I think he's coming back. He better come back. What do we do if he doesn't? And they're looking into heaven where Jesus went, and, and the angels come and they say to him, what do they say? They say this, men of Galilee, disciples of Jesus Christ, why are you standing there looking up to heaven in the same way Jesus went, he'll come back again. That's our hang on to. That's our assurance. That's our keep on keeping on motivation. In fact, the Apostle Paul grabbed that reality so well that he wrote one of the best, one of the best declarations of the resurrection life. The chapter of 1 Corinthians 15. And here in verses 51 through 57, listen to what he says. 
The Apostle Paul's words are these, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the imperishable, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hosanna! Hosanna!
Thank you for placing the wrath of God on your shoulders. Thank you, Lord, for being our victorious deliverer. And thank you that when life around me doesn't make sense, I can look to you and know that your suffering, your suffering paid it all. And one day all things will be made right and made new. May we go forth in this week to embrace that and the journey ahead. Father, we pray this in your precious name, in the name of Jesus Christ.